So hi, Matt, how are you doing? Thank you so much for participating in this. And I wish it was in person, but Scottish Edge is this wonderful competition that we've created up in Scotland. I know you know quite a lot about it. We really appreciate you coming on today. How are you? Yeah, very good. Thank you, Tom. Very good. I mean, I'd be uh, looking forward to a bit of travel and uh, being able to meet up in person. But for now, I'm, uh, we're on yet another Zoom call, but I'm sure we, we're getting through it. Yeah. OK, so listen, it's been for those of people who are on this Zoom who haven't heard of you, and there might still be a few, because up until 12 months ago, you really kept yourself and the Hut Group under the radar. But the past 12 months, maybe just since September 2020, it has been an absolute roller coaster for you and the business you've, you've founded. If I could try and sum up for those who are first time hut aficionados. So you grew up in Burnley, you went to university, you joined the Caldwell Group run by John Caldwell. In 2004, you started the hut group with John Gallimore, selling CDs and games online. And the hut group was kind of growing steadily, there was ups and downs. But then it really began to take off 2014. The American huge private equity house KKR came in, took 20%. 2016, you're trading over 100 different websites. And then 2020. So you're trading in 169 countries. In September 2020, you float on the London Stock Exchange. It's the biggest tech float in London ever. You create more millionaires on your payroll than any company ever floated. THG is a value of over six and a half billion pounds. You're employing 10,000 people, 3,000 of them, 3,000 of them recruited during lockdown. And to top it all, you've just given 100 million to charity. Where did it all go wrong, Matt? <laughs> I tell you what, Tom, it's uh, it's always lively anyway. Well, that's very nice yeah. of you. It's always lively with you, Matt, that's for sure. So let me take you back a little bit, because everybody on the call today is looking for how you get started and how you scaled up. We're always, um, we've also created this thing called Scale Up Scotland to take the best out of Scottish Edge and peer-to-peer -peer learning and get them really moving their businesses in Scotland. So growing up near Burnley, um, was, there, was there anything in your background that kind of was a bit of a clue as to what was going to happen? I mean, what was it, what was it like, Matt? I mean, I don't think there'd necessarily be any clues in, in, in my own background as to, as to the direction I was, I was going, Tom. Um, all I knew was that I wanted to try and do better. And, there, and, and I had it in me. And, and I've always got this memory of being in junior school and in a class where I got a calculator out. I was trying to work out how long it would take me and how much I'd have to earn to be able to own my own terrace house in Cone, right. in, in near Burnley. And, uh, you know, look, the houses back then were, were, were very cheap indeed. But, but that, I remember, you know, looking back on that through the years and thinking that's probably not usual for like a 10-year, 9, 10-year-old kid to be thinking, how do I get my own house? Um, and, and, you know, look, and that probably has a lot of insecurity behind that that drives that kind of thinking. But, but you know, I don't think it's just regular. Everything's just regular about my life. And, and I genuinely mean that. Regular, regular in terms of... Um, be no different than someone in Glasgow growing up or anywhere else and, and, and you need a bit of luck along the way and, and, and we've had some luck that, that have helped us as well Sure, so you're at school you're telling me you're just this regular guy, were you, were you any good at school? Were you academically bright or? Um, 
Look, my brother was brighter than me. I believe that. I still think he, you know, he is now. And I've been to university, and 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 he he didn't. Um, I mean, look, what did you go to university, Matt? What was the thought process there? Had had other people in your family gone to university? You the first. No, no. What what had happened is I left school actually, and I went and worked in the same factory that my brother worked in in in, in my hometown. Very traditional northern town. Still got the factories at the end of the terrace streets. He was working in there earning money. So as soon as I left school, I went and worked in there. And uh, and, and I was just aware that a couple of friends that I had were going to go to college and uni, and, and you know that was their plan. And then literally the week before college started. I actually went down to the local college and I registered and gave up my job. So I was actually working in a factory and I was working double shifts every day. So 16 hours a day in a factory from the age of 16. So I was getting two paychecks for a year older than I was. And it was immense. But one of the best lessons was my dad tried to take 80% of my checks off me, my my cash. He got paid in in cash, actually, in a a brown envelope every week at the end of the week. And uh, my dad thought that my board should be 80%. And, I, and I, 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 honestly, I couldn't, couldn't cope with it. <laughs> so I thought, I'm, <laughs> and actually, that was, I'm thinking if I carry on this way anyway, someone's taking this off me. I might as well go to college. And actually, I got expelled after the first year, Tom. Uh, oh, I didn't I, know that, Matt. This is I something did. new to me. I got expelled, um, and for, for not for bad behaviour or anything like that. Um, per se, I mean, I just didn't attend as well as I should have done. My, my brother had had, had 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 a bit of misfortune in in some direction he took, and and he was he was helping Her Majesty out with some tasks, and uh, so I spent a lot of my time going going visiting him, and instead of going to lessons, and I actually got kicked out of out of uh, college. Um, but the, 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 you know, you need good fortune in your lifetime, right? And, and I've been fortunate on many occasions with the people I've met. And, and the subjects I did, economics, maths, um, some other things as well. Uh, my economics teacher actually rang my home number and said, he needs to come back to this college. I'll put him under my tutorage. He can be part of the, my, my department. He needs to take another subject like psychology because he headed up like social sciences there. And, and, and I think he needs to go, he needs to come back because, you know, I think he, he, he could do well. A guy called Mike Smith. I've never been able to track him down to this day, actually. I've been trying recently to thank him. And, and so I went, back, I went back to college, right? So I would have been back in that factory doing something like that. Somebody out of their own volition picked up a phone and said, get yourself back here, right? When he came into work that day. And he changed the course of my life. Um, and I went back and I straight aid everything. And, and, you know, it was amazing because I had someone there. And my brother, my brother was, was, was uh, back, back with us. I had, a, I had a, a teachers that, that were behind me. And, and I just went all the way through and, and, and did really well in my academics. It, it, it is so amazing. The many great entrepreneurs I've met, there's always turning points in their life and it could go either way and um, even the big ones like yourself just just someone took a, an interest for whatever reason great entrepreneurs I've met there's always turning points in their life and it could go either way and um, even the big ones like yourself just just someone took a, an interest for whatever reason so universities kind of done do you go straight to the Caldwell group from university no I went into accountancy um and I, I, I went into corporate recovery so businesses in distress so what I'd learned through my economics my, my teacher was an economics teacher back in college I had a real interest in how business works supply demand and all those kind of factors and so I was I was pretty good at it because I was interested in it and then at university, I went deeper into that. And, and so by that point, I'd really got myself interested in how businesses operate and what goes well, what doesn't go well. And so I decided, I thought I, I was good at maths. So accountancy is boring. I don't care who you are. They can't, you can't get that excited about accountancy per se, not for me as an individual. 
but it's an incredible business discipline. So if you can understand it, I think it stands you in great stead. So I thought, well, I'll try and match the two. And I, and I looked around for work in big organizations that do turnarounds and receiverships and, and, and getting really into, into stuck into businesses that have been through the mill and, uh, and trying to understand more. And, and so that's what I managed to do. I went to a firm called Arthur Anderson in their corporate recovery, which was in itself was quite, quite strange. Most people are going to audit, work there for a few years, then go into corporate recovery. But I went straight into there, thankfully. And, um, and I, got, I was in, in, in a different business every few weeks that was in distress. And so it was just an amazing opportunity. So it's a great amazing. education, Mark. You're getting exposed to all this and you're learning by doing, which is one of the things that we try and coach. Oh, the, the doing bit was amazing, right? So all my peers were doing audits, which were which which you don't get any exposure. You're in a room with folders, and you and and yet I was in businesses addressing workforces, you know that that you know trying to calm them. In some instances, unfortunately, telling them, "Look, this is closing down, or we're going to have to you know reduce the workforce." Really tough life lessons that I were having to to deal with and get involved with, and understanding the importance of a job to somebody, you know, so you're not just a number on a piece of paper, you're going in and you're having to tell 50 people in a room, your job's gone here in a small town. This business isn't viable. The bank needs its money back. You know, you, you, proper life lessons that you, you can't begin to, uh, to, to, to appreciate really. So, so that, that I needed that kind of background as well, because going into the Cordwell group afterwards, you know, that was a, that, that's a tough environment. So you, you needed, some skin so, did, so let me ask you, why did you choose the Caldwell Group? Obviously run by John Caldwell, one of UK's biggest and sometimes controversial entrepreneurs. What, what attracted you in there? Well, the truth is money, right? <laughs> cold, cold, cold hard cash. There was no other, no other way to put it. Um, Caldwell was known for paying very high salaries because right. they would – in the Northwest, they, they wanted young people that they could mould or burn. You know, you would, you would go in and you would, you would, you know, succeed or fail in a blink. So, you know, but they would pay a very big entry fee. So at 26 years of age, I had a mortgage and, and all of those things. And, and I, when I could get an £80,000 salary going to work for John Cordwell, versus a market rate of 40 or 50. And then there was a promise of 50% bonuses and all these things. But there was this huge, you know, health warning came with it to say, you know, you, you speak to anyone on the outside, you know, you've got a 25% chance of being in that job in 12 months. So you were more... <laughs> the tough deep. environment. So yeah. what's the kind of... What's the, what's the positive lessons you learned from um, the Coldwell Group and phones for you? Um, I mean, look, the, the main guy that was running that from my side was a guy called Craig Bennett, who was the CFO. And he he taught me how to run a business uh, in that sense. He would ring me every single morning at 6.30 a.m. Um, so at 6.30, my phone would ring. So I, I, first of all, you've got to be up early every morning because if you don't take <laughs> that call, you're fired, right? So, <laughs> And I, mean, I just, you're not, you, 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 you'd be fired if that, if that was a consistent failure. And, and he would ask me at 6.30 an incredible level of detailed business questions. So I would need to be all over my business in the detail and I'd need to be able to forecast what was happening in the future and think ahead. Um, and so, so that pressure to understand the business model was immense. And, uh, and, and, and so I very much appreciate that training, that discipline, because it kept me on my toes from the off. Do you phone your team at 6.30 every morning now, Matt? No, I don't. Uh, I don't. Uh, no, it's, I, it's 5 a.m., isn't it? Yeah, I phone, them, I phone them at all hours, to be honest with you. <laughs> but um, I don't do that kind of regular thing. Uh, that was regular every single morning. Um, ours is different. So that would typically be my main conversation with 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 you know John or Craig with that time in the morning. I speak to my team all day, every day, 
up until bedtime. I don't need to ring them at 6.30, you know, they've, they've got kids or whatever. I don't, you know, world's moved yeah. on. So tell me, because this is a question I'm asked a lot, is how do you know when to leave a job to start your own business? How, how, how do you know? How did you work it out, Matt? I, I'm getting the sense that you're money-driven, so you've got a material goals in there, but how do you actually go from being paid really well to saying, no, I want to do it for myself? What's the, what's the process that, that went on? I mean, yeah. Um, so what I, what I did on that, Tom, is I bridged the gap. I carried on working um, and putting every penny I, I got into the business. Quite, quite a pivotal moment for me was me and my, my ex had split up. And so that actually gave me an extra spurring on. I had nothing. So what bit, what bit we had had gone. And so I was starting afresh, but I had a high salary. And everyone around me, had high salaries in the business too, but they were spending it in a way that, you know, probably wasn't, you know, wasn't ideal. Um, And so I thought, well, look, what do I do here? I've I've got to make this count. This won't last forever. You were always under this, this, this concern that next month you might not have your job. And so, and so uh, I decided that, you know, I I should think about the internet. I'd been, I put made a transaction online. I could see it. I actually took it to John Cordwell, believe it or not. Did, and, uh, did you? Right. Yeah, I did do, yeah. For, 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 for three, four months, we discussed it. I, I put it at the end of my board meetings to say, I think we should do this, do this. Instead of, you know, we had a lot of stores in, in the group that were failing and needed to be shut and whatever. And, and you could support the, the internet with the stores and do this omni-channel thing. Anyway, look, we then had a blockbuster few months in, in the business. And John said, why would we waste our time on this? I'm going to sell the group. You maximize this. And then, and, you know, I'm out of here in a few months. I'm all good. And, um, and and so what I did was I was earning a lot of money at that point. I think in my final year at Cordwell, I earned £2 million, believe it or not, because we sold wow. the group. We sold the group and I got a little, I got £1.6 million share of it as in you know they gave me that as a reward but then after that i'd never earned that money again so i was back down into a a strong salary really but but that salary might not last long but but that was as good as it could ever get so i knew that had come to an end i had a strong salary and i thought well if i want to do anything else i've got to do it for myself and um and so I, i ran with the idea i had and 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 at that point i built up the cash I put every penny I had into the business, thinking that would be lots. Thinking now I've made the secure jump, I can. I've developed the idea, the concept. I'll go now and make the jump, and it wasn't enough. So, <laughs> and I wasn't taking the salary. So all of a sudden, you go from this super wealthy position in many ways to to having a really crappy loss making business with no income and no and, and all your money's gone into it. So, I didn't. And the business. And the initial business was Matt. What 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 was the business idea? It's similar to Amazon back in the day, you know. So you're selling entertainment products online. Um, right. and, but and this what, is early days. This is two thousand four. Two thousand and four. Yeah, so it's a long time ago. And and there were other players doing really well. The margins were there. It, it made a lot of sense at the time. Um, but but in setting a business up in in, in what is a very big evolving market using your own capital is very, very, di- against big players is very tricky. But, but thankfully, we, you know, quickly worked out that, well, we're going to have to change this business model to something different. And, and, and the biggest change we did, Tom, was build our own technology immediately. So literally within six weeks of launch, trying to work out how to, to change the P&L to conserve cash, we built our own technology. And, and was that's that- been- just a hunch, Matt, because it's, I mean, it's going to lead on to some seismic decisions down the line. But at that point, was that a gut feel? Was that, how, how did you come up with that? I mean, it, you, your business is, is poor, right? So I, I take it back to being, going back to corporate recovery when I left university and I go into distressed businesses. And you, you, you're just soaking up around you that how you look at a business and say, it's got to change or it's going to go bust. And so you look at our business and we were sat there going, it's going to go bust. Stop it going bust. What do we change? Well, 
got to change the cost base, rule number one. Well, the quickest way of changing the cost base is build our own technology, believe it or not. And, and by doing that, that was a fraction of the cost of using someone else's technology back in 2004. So, it, so, so that was an easy one. And then, and then the second thing was Google was too expensive for us. And so we had, to, we had to reduce the marketing. Well, the best way I could do that is use someone else's brands. And so we rang around all of British High Street and said, let us launch you online with our technology that hasn't been built yet. And, um, <laughs> and thankfully, we got both. We built our own technology and we got some big high street retailers. And so we fixed the two big issues in our P&L. And, and, and it's just simple numbers. When you looked at it, Tommy, you know, hunch or no hunch, you're just looking at it saying, well, we either need a truckload more cash. I don't know anyone with any cash. I'm the only person who had the cash, and I had not left. <laughs> so, Did, and, and, he was, and how, how important in the early days was it to have someone to bounce things off? Or were you very much, no, nah, this is the way we're doing it. Come on. Um, I mean, look, who did we have to? I didn't really have a great deal. I, I, you know, in the very early days, David Moore was good. He's a he's a friend of ours. You know, David. He put some money yep. in back me on day one, so I could always say to him, "What do you think?" And and he give me some some honest feedback. But the reality is, in in many ways, everyone's backing you. So if you spend all your time trying to garner, tell me what to do to other people, you're the wrong person to run that business. And 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 um, David David said it to me really clear one day, which is, you know, no one can walk in your shoes, man. Which is a really really sort of grand way of saying it's all on you. <laughs> you decide. <laughs> so you can, you could take it two ways. Yeah, oh, yeah, great. No, no one can walk in my shoes. The reality is he's saying, you decide on everything. We're just here backing you. Get on with it. Yeah, yeah. The, the upside and the downside, it's interesting. So the business is getting going. You know, where's the – and every great entrepreneur I ever speak to, there are, there are points where it can go one way or the other. What's the kind of points in your business where you think – and, and you only really see these things looking backwards. Where's the kind of points that you think, wow, I've got to go this way or I've got a chance of building something big? Um, I mean, it's a really hard question, that, Tom, because I actually think those points arrive on an almost quarterly basis. And it might sound crazy, but it, it just genuinely do. We just come through some major experiences, um, and we're just starting new ones. And 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 so what you tend to do is, as you say, you look back on them over time and go, "Wow, that was important." What we're getting better at is knowing in the moment these are this is important. So 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 it feels really lively all the time. But but even going back in the day. When we moved our technology, we built our own technology. That, that's been pivotal, unquestionable. When we decided to move into beauty, you know, and, and get some, raise some money to do that, you know, that was pivotal. Um, we, we met you, Tom, around there and as well before, before we did that. We were always skinned, never had any money, you know, always on the edge of our pants, you know, begging you know, borrowing whatever we possibly could from anyone and anywhere to stay alive. And, uh, and we had a terrible business model where we'd lose money for 10 months a year and we'd, get, we'd make it in two. So, the, you know, you were, you were so hungry for 10 months uh, of the year. You, you, you'd come into Q4, you know, totally starved of any, of any cash. Um, but so changing the model into beauty, which is an all-year-round business model, was just amazing. Nutrition, you know, the moving to nutrition and the healthier lifestyles and the rest of it, that was, that was a pivotal moment as well. You know, and, and, then, and then even the people you meet along the way, Tom, you know, so, so sometimes it's events in your business, but just as important, if not more important, is the people who touch on your life during the course and embracing them. And then, and then you, you returning that behavior back to other people, you know, in a similar way. And that's how the, the cycle of life works, I believe. And so 
various people I've met, you know, from David Moore back in the day when he, he was my recruitment guy who put me into Cordwell, you know, and then he ends up back in my business and he's made fortunes and he's still in our lives today. You know, meeting you, Tom, right? You, you know that the Entrepreneur of the Year award in 2008, December 2008, was, was everything to us back then. Absolutely yeah. pivotal. And everything that spun out of that has been pivotal to our business. You know? Well, I remember um, coming along there. It was a competition for UK entrepreneurs trying to find the best in Britain. And um, it was right in the middle of the financial crisis. And I was having a shit time. Oh, my goodness. I, was, um, I could only stop losing money when, um, when the markets closed. And I remember saying to Peter Cummings, head of the bank at the time, look, I can't come and sit on the stage and judge this. I'm, I'm doing terrible. And he said, look, you've got to turn up. It was just, there was something about the two of you together, which I just knew that, um, well, I thought I knew there was something, that glint in your eye that you were going to work this out. And you were learning so much along the way and pivoting. And it's, and it's something that we try and coach people is that, you know, the, the entrepreneurs we want to back are the entrepreneurs who say, yeah, I told you yesterday that we were going right, but the, but the data has changed. The facts have changed and we're now going left, so don't worry about it, and especially in tech businesses because it's so fast moving and you've got to be confident to tell your backers, yeah, I told you that, but I'm telling you something different now. and we loved that when we met you. And I was supposed to mentor you, Matt, but it's, it's absolutely sure. I've learned a lot more from you than you've ever learned from me, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, about that, Tom. But, but I think uh, it's a re- really good point, that, Tom. If you, if you were to think about probably the greatest businessman to walk the planet yet in Jeff Bezos, right? He, he, ha- he has to be the greatest yeah. person in, in business to have walked the planet yet. He started off as an online book retailer, right? And he's now an absolute tech titan with the biggest yeah. advertising business in the world, with the biggest hosting business in the world. He's got, I mean, I'd be surprised if he can even buy a book off Amazon these days. I don't know anyone who does buy a book off them. So <laughs> five years ago. I still buy books, Matt. I still buy books. But you know what I mean? Five years ago, Kindle was everything on there. I don't know anyone who buys a Kindle anymore and they're onto something else and something else. So, so this idea that you set off on a journey in your business and that's it. I think that's very rare, very, very, very rare. rare. And, and anybody who's listening, you should download Jeff Bezos' latest shareholder letter. I sent it to you. I sent it to everybody I know. And it's just the best business letter I have ever read, and everybody's got to read it. So you're, you're beginning to think of it scaling up, and digital is a great business model in order to scale up. How about your team? How are you attracting and retaining talent, Matt? What, are you, what have you learned from your past encounters to be dealing with people? How are you putting this team together? One of the things is, you know, being, I'm really clear that you've got to change your management team from time to time. So it's great if you can take the same people with you for, for 20 years, 17 years or whatever. But, but again, that's just never happening. Right. I'm probably on my sixth senior management team in 17 years in some form. And there's been times when I've cleaned the entire management team out in, in one, three, four month period. And I don't think you can grow at pace. Personally, I, I don't think I can without doing that at times. And, and that's one of the biggest lessons I've had in it is, look, it's, it's never the business comes first. Not everyone can grow with the business at the rate you want. When I make a change, I promote from within. So I don't bring some outsiders in to rock the boat and just, you know, swap the huge management swap outs. Normally, you know, it's someone else's chance to have a go. And um, and then we back that up by giving equity away, Tom, of of really large proportions. So not just (laughs) senior people who, you know, know, we, we, we share it around and, and and as a result of that you end up with quite a, a, an ecosystem of quite a buzz it just so, works so talk to me about culture in the business because as businesses grow i've got this thing that the bigger you get the dumber you get 
because you've got layers of people and decisions get taken further away from the customer. How do you keep that entrepreneurial flair in the business as it gets to, I mean, 10,000 people now, 3,000 of them recruited through the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, it, it, it's definitely doable, Tom. I mean, and, and I come back to some of the biggest companies in the world that are founder-led. You know, they don't lose their edge. They don't. And, and I think, I think you know, what's great is the more founders you can keep at the helm of a business, the more likely they are to pivot and twist and turn and try and keep growing. The issue, I think, I think that's such, a, such an important point versus if you're brought in to run a business, it's a different thing, right? You're, you're brought in to manage a situation, to take it in, in a measured and calm way. Whereas if it's your baby, you want to you want it to, to, to shoot for the stars. So so I think the very first thing is founder led businesses, you know, tend to stay more entrepreneurial. You've only got to look at the big US guys to see the the, the, the things they, they've done. In our business as well, you know, there's just lots of things that we do. We we share the wealth between lots of people. That creates a buzz and, and an excitement. We my senior team have all been homegrown. So we try, try, try to avoid bringing in a big hire that sits at the top. You know, um, we still bring in big hires, but they've got to come in beneath and they work their way up, you know, from a certain level and they get ingrained. And, and that's a big danger of derailing things. Um, and so, so bringing talent through and, and, and doing things that way. And also doing exciting things, right? If you if, if how you behave, you know, if you keep it alive and you keep changing things in different directions, the whole business stays fleet footed. I believe it. And, uh, and we do that, right. I, you know, I know now that the management team barely know what I'm up to right now. And, and, <laughs> and if I come to them later this week with some news or whatever, they'll be like, this is mad, but, but, but it, it then brings an energy. So yeah. it's just, just the way it is. Yeah, no, definitely. It's a, it's, it's a real trait. And actually, West Coast Capital, we are all about the founder um, because that's exactly what we're looking for is um, people who keep keep the entrepreneurial spirit and don't go and make it dumber and dumb it down as, as we go, especially in tech and digital businesses now where it's so fast moving. Um, so, you know, you're you're going along, you've built a very successful business, you're pretty much under the radar, and then you decide to float. Just talk me through the kind of, what are you thinking? Um, I, I, the honest answer there, Tom, was we were coming into the pandemic or we are in the pandemic and sat there going, the world's going to change from this. And, you know, things should accelerate in our favour. So I'd spent year after year, you know, generating my own cash, borrowing money. You know, most of the investment investors that came on board were buying secondary shares. And I was just sat there thinking, do you know, if I can access capital now and deploy it at scale, I can bridge the gap between a UK business and the US guys. And and so I wrestled with it for a for a, a couple of days, not much longer than a couple of days, if I'm honest, and just thought, I'm doing it. And I remember making the phone call to my M&A guy and said, by the way, we're doing it, you know, <laughs> and we're doing it now. And, 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 you know, I don't want to mess around. And we, we, and we did it in unbelievable timescale. But the access to capital at a time when the world was changing, I have this kind of view that when there's chaos running, around you should try your best to claim the center ground because most people are undecided if they want it or not so you can take it the easiest and so i just thought you know what no one's going to be listing a business in this environment but so, so but the opportunities to deploy capital should be immense so let's just go and do it and and, and that was the primary primary sort of logic really yeah a warren buffett quote comes to mind because he says be be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. And yeah. You just saw the, the whole thing changing and you thought, we've got to make the most of this. And, um, you know, as I said in the beginning, the flotation allowed more millionaires on your payroll than any other company in the history 
of the London Stock Exchange. Um, is that something, a, a source of pride for you? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I love it, Tom. Um, you know, and I just I just love the fact that I touch on various people in the business who, who I know when I walk past them in the corridor or I see them grabbing a coffee, uh, I know that they've their lives have been changed in some form. You know, not everyone's had the huge numbers, uh, but but drivers or whatever it can be can be varying people. Of, you know, you know they've been and bought houses and and things with with the cash. And then at the big scale, you know, I get people texting me saying one of your directors is buying a house for X, and that X is like three times the cost of my own house. <laughs> <laughs> and I sit there, and it just I think um, it. It makes it feel like it's a, we're doing this together, um, and uh, it does. I, I, I like it. And you know, you made a huge announcement um, over the past few days about the commitment to charity. I mean, what was your what was your thought process there? Because you know, it's it used to be that people took a lot of time to build a business and make money, and then. When they retired, they gave it away. I mean, but you've just you've just cut the timeline as you do and everything, and just did it all at once. Oh, look, I mean, I'm hoping I'm going to do a lot of it, Tom. Right? Um, so, so it, the the benefit I have is, uh, I think if you if if you start with a lot of money, then you you know it, it must be harder to give it away. I I didn't have anything. I've never had anything. So I'm not missing anything, right? Uh, and and so I didn't have anything. Now on paper, I've got I've got like a, a lot. And so to be able to take some of that and then do these huge things with it, you know, whilst my kids are young, the, you know, they can see it. Uh, my wife can get involved, and people around me, my team, can see what we do and the rest of it. It's purely selfish because I get to see it. I get to be involved in it. Um, not that I want to be involved in it, but I, 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 you know, it's nice to see it. And 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 so, why not just do it now? I can't. I'm not. If you if you're going to give it away, I might as well give it away now. And um, and then if if you enjoy it and you get the right things from it, you've got the opportunity, hopefully, to do to do it time and time again. But I didn't have it to start with, so it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> The other way of looking at it. So, so Matt, you've been generous with your time as ever, and thank you very much. I know how much you've got on your plate. But for everybody who's tuning in today, um, who's maybe thinking of starting or thinking of scaling up their business, you know, Jeff Bezos calls it day one. Every day is day one. You keep that passion in your business. So, have you any tips, any things that you've learned along the way? that we can share with the folks on the call today who hopefully they can go and emulate yourself. What you should start with is, you know, what's fair, but also, but, but really what is, what, who do I want with me? You know, who do I want for the journey? Because uh, I see it all the time. So many, so many other businesses around me that have gone bust chasing the ace of valuation. And, and it terrifies me, you know? Um, and, and so, the people you're doing it with matter to me way more than today's price. And then and then everything else will take care of itself. Yeah, well, as, as usual, Matt, you've been very generous with your time. So on behalf of Scottish Edge and Scale Up Scotland and um, all entrepreneurs who hopefully listen to this and be inspired to go and do it, um, good on you. And we look forward to the next stage of the journey and um, for those of you who don't know THG, get on the websites and buy something. So, Matt, thanks very much. We'll very see you well. soon. And good luck. Cheers, Tom. You take care.